So, if you were to Google Elon or go on YouTube, most of the interviews are about business, but I thought since this is about dreams and life skills, we focus more on the various turning points in Elon's life from where he grew up in South Africa to where he is now, because everyone has a journey. So I thought it would be cool that when you look at your life, there's going to be certain parts where you're like, if you went this way, you end up here, but if you go this way, you end up there. And in Elon's case, he went from literally Victoria, South Africa, to Kingston, Ontario, Canada, to Pennsylvania, which is the East Coast, to Stanford, which is in Northern California, down here. And it's a total of, if you look up, can you make uh, your smaller? So if you, if you look on the map, Elon, and currently this is correct, so Victoria, South Africa is here, North Sea is part of South Africa, then B is where he's in Canada, C was where he went to school, and then D, another school, and then finally E is where he is now. But if you add up all the amount of times that he came somewhere, it was 11,786 miles. And so when you look at your life, wherever you are, Think about the fact that maybe you're where you started your first five or 10 or 15 years. Maybe you're where you are with your high school. But the point is, Elon had a journey, got to where he was. So I was going to talk to you specifically about three things. How important the place was that you grew up, the people that you were around that you were trying to with, with. And lastly, like, is the purpose that you have the reason why you found and saw the people that you surrounded yourself with? So the first question ask you is just like South Africa. Right. Do you know that Nelson Mandela is from South Africa, so he's like one of the most amazing leaders in the world. Sir Lee Theron is from South Africa. Dr. Patterson Chong who's like a revolutionary doctor. Why do you think South Africa, and you're always from South Africa, so what do you think about the culture and the people there make it a place where you have all these visionaries that grow up there? Um, I think there's great visionaries in almost any, from almost any country. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I think mean, certainly there's some great people like right now that sort of came from South Africa. Um, I, I don't know. If, I don't, I'm not sure. If, you know, if there's certainly an eclectic mix of people in South Africa. Um, sort of a wide range of cultures, and I think some of those interactions are pretty helpful to come up with new ideas. Um, I think that yeah, the United States also has a great mixture of cultures. And, a lot of incredible people that they can work here. In fact, more, more uh, many people come to the United States than anywhere else in the world. Uh, and the reason I wanted to come here was because like, the, the forefront of technology is in the US. Uh, not like technology, but so it's not the right place to go. <laughs> and what about the people you surround yourself with? Like your mom, your brother, your sister, your cousins? I mean, what kind of an impact do they give to you? Because you, you might have a dream but you still need the people around you to either support or discourage you from your dreams. So did you have a very supportive family? Um, I don't think they were, un they were unsupportive, but I can't say they were particularly supportive. Uh, my father was quite unhelpful. Uh, and uh, yeah, I got beaten up a lot at school. So. Really? Yeah, it sucks. Yeah, for, for what? I could have a good reason, I think. But, uh, um, I got read a lot of books, and uh, and, and I was this, uh, for a long time, up until the 10th grade, I was pretty much the smallest kid in my class. Uh, and then kind of sort of grew after that. But um, and, and I mean, I think part of it was like going to for being like a bit of a smart ass sometimes. But um, yeah, being sort of a small bookish smart ass is a recipe for disaster. <laughs> <laughs> And it's not a very violent place, and my violence is like my thing. So what would you suggest to our students, though, let's say they've been bullied, maybe their mom or dad aren't supportive, and like you, I was the shortest kid in my class till 10th grade. Right. They always got bullied. So yeah. what would you suggest, like, how did you deal with that when you were a kid? Uh, mostly I ran. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think run or hide, those are the two. Not really. Um, so, yeah, like, I have a classroom during recess. Okay, so that's what you suggested to have your hair. I mean, it's, I'm not sure what the other options are. Uh, so, um, 
And uh, actually, when I so I left by myself when I was 17, against my parents' wishes and, and with almost no financial support. So uh, when I was in Canada, I think, you know, sort of support myself through various uh, odd jobs. And uh, I managed to get a student loan and go through college, but I paid for my own college. Well, I mean, that loans plus work. <laughs> Eventually, we have a lot. And why did you choose Canada? Why, why uh, Queen's University that we're in? Uh, yeah, uh, my mom was born in Canada. So my, my, dad was, uh, my, my grandfather, I should say, was actually American from Minnesota. Uh, but uh, my, my mom had a flight for US citizenship before a certain age. So, so she, she didn't have that. But she was born in Canada. So I, could, uh, I applied for her Canadian passport and mine at the same time. Yeah, I have three weeks after the festival. And then from Canada to Penn to Stanford, like, what was the reason for that? Like, you just not go directly to Stanford or the West Coast. That's what you ended up not to go to. Um, yeah, well, yeah. So, um, you know, in Canada, the colleges are, are less expensive. It's kind of like maybe a state school, like, uh, you know, if you go to, like, uh, you know, University, University of California or, or the you know, Cal State uh, universities, the, uh, the tuition is much less than, than it is in other places. So, um, so I think my way through college anyway, I could uh, go to some place other than Canada which is a kind of scholarship or, or something like that. So I didn't really think about U.S. universities. But I, after my second year at Queens, I applied to UPAC uh, and uh, actually did, did get a scholarship, so uh, ended up going there in the third year. Um, and then uh, after graduating, decided to pursue grad studies and applied to Stanford and got grad. And so let's talk a little bit about some of the, the turning points. So I read that when you were 12, you saw your first computer code. Um, yeah. You gave me a class of $500. Right. So again, you have an idea, as all the students have. Who did you reach out to? Did you reach out to your mom? Did you reach out to your, your cousin? Or, or like, how did you make that, oh, I have this product to, here's $500, you know what? Um, well, I, I read a lot of computer magazines. Um, and there was a, a computer magazine that uh, you could sell um, software to, and then publish the software, and then send you a check. Uh, and um, and I, 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 I like playing video games, so. Uh, I, I need more money to buy a better computer and more video games. So <laughs> I wrote some software and, and sold it to, to the night, sold a company or another one. So when you were 12, did you have doubts? Because a lot of students might have those doubts where we have an idea, we think it's good, but again, from the idea to the completion, you just say, oh, I like this game, I'm going to try it out, so I'm just going to do it. Um, well, I just really like computers and programming was kind of fun. You know, it was, it, it seemed kind of amazing that you could make a computer all these things. So I, uh, yeah, so so I, 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 I didn't think they would accept the, I, I didn't I think they'd actually buy the software, but you know, if you don't try, then you definitely have 0% chance. So okay, cool. um, so I, I, I mailed it in and then they uh, they bought it and I don't think they knew I was for as well, actually. Do they know you now? I think, yeah. I guess I, I, after I sold the second program to them, I, I went and visited their offices. And, so. and then you fast forward to your college. I watched certain interviews, and they, they, you, you kind of tell people, you know, I thought about what I want to do. I thought about the internet, sustainable energy, and like space travel. And now people might believe you because you have two companies, or actually four companies that you created or started yeah. and invested in the fifth one, right? So right. A lot of companies these creative yeah. started. Um, but back in college, did you share your dreams with your classmates? Because can you imagine if I were with you in college and you say, hey, I want to like fly into outer space? Did you have a desire that you share that with your classmates? Or again, going back to the from the idea to the completion, what are some steps you might have taken so that students can think about that? Uh, sure. Well, well, I mean, when I was in college, I just thought about the things that were might most affect the, the future of the world. And uh, there are actually five, five things, three of which I was confident would be positive, and two of which I thought could be, have a mixed outcome, or, or a question, 
you know, not quite so now. And the, the three that I thought were definitely good were sort of space, space travel, particularly making like multiplanetary sustainable energy and the internet. And then there's uh, writing genetics, reading writing genetics, and uh, artificial intelligence, which are, you know, more of a thorny issue. So um, I didn't think at the time that I would be involved in all three, uh, but those are just what I thought would most affect the future. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, at, at first, I, I didn't, it's, it's not as though I ex uh, expect to start a company. I, I actually just applied for a, a job at, uh, at Netscape, which was the only internet company in wow. 95. Um, and then that sent my resume to the charity bank. And, uh, and I tried to hang out in the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good job there. Yeah, but uh, um, I was too shy to talk to anyone, so that didn't work. Um, so, so then I just started writing some internet software, and, uh, and then my brother came down and joined me, and we created a company. Uh, but the, we, we still had, unfortunately, uh, uh, no money, so uh, we had a few thousand dollars. And uh, so we could, we could afford to rent this really crummy office, which was cheaper than an apartment. So we just slept on a couch in the office, and then shot up the YMCA. <laughs> <laughs> So one more question, and I'm going to open it up to the students and some of the volunteers. So I was talking to Andy Bell, as the CEO of the shelter, and he talked about how the solutions that we want to find for any problem isn't just about resources, it's about relationships. So for you, with a guy named uh, Harry Rosen. Harry yeah, Rosen. right. How oh, you really know a lot of details. <laughs> <laughs> I've read a lot. But Harold Rosen, yeah. 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 So Harold Rosen was one of the guys that was instrumental in helping Elon with Tesla and SpaceX, is that uh, Not so much with uh, SpaceX, but more, more with Tesla. Um, and uh, in 2003, uh, about a year after Tesla, and the SpaceX was started. So SpaceX was the reason he called me, but but then it wasn't all that helpful with SpaceX, but he was really helpful in, in, in getting Tesla going. Um, and he brought uh, J.B. Straubel, who was uh, uh, ended up being one of the co-founders of, of, of Tesla to the lunch, and uh, they, were, they were trying to do like a, like a hydrogen airplane or something, which uh, uh, it sounds cool, but I don't think very practical. Um, and uh, yeah, but then they also mentioned uh, 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 electric cars because Harold had a, done an electric car company called Rosen Motors that didn't uh, didn't ultimately succeed, but uh, both JV and Harold were really interested in electric cars. Um, and I mentioned that uh, I was going to be doing my grad studies on uh, ultra capacitors for using electric cars. And then they, they said that I should get a test drive in a prototype for an AC propulsion uh, of an electric, it was an electric conversion of a kid uh, gasoline sports car. Um, and that really made it clear that you could create a long range, uh, fast uh, electric car. And, um, and and so great Tesla as a result. So my question is for the students: they have a dream, they have to find people like a, like Harold. How did you actually meet Harold? Was it like a their friend, or how did that? I'm not sure. I think he we think he heard about SpaceX and they gave me a call and suggested having lunch. Okay. Um, and uh, it's just how it looks. Does that happen a lot? Like people come out of the room and say, hey, Elon, I want to help you. Or, well, it's just easy. It didn't happen in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you suggest to people that you know, aren't in a more established position as you, but how do you find those business contacts or people that can develop those relationships to help you? Uh, well, I think it's, it's worth like, going to, if you, if you go to places where such people are likely to be, um, and uh, and they just you know, can try sort of cold calling people out of the blue. Um, and I got I got a couple of summer jobs that way. Um, and, uh, yeah, but I think just sort of go out and try to meet as many people as possible. Good, good way to go. Thank you. So, any questions from the students or volunteers? I know uh, Majari. Um, did you have any downfalls? Where you thought was bad, but was good in the long run. Well, this has been sort of 
uh, problems that we encountered along the way. Um, I mean, um, all, all my companies at one point or another came close to failing. So this is very close. Um, uh, 2008 was probably the, the low point uh, because uh, we had our third rocket failure uh, in a row, so we'd only had failures until that point. And I'd only plan to have enough money for three launches, so uh, I'm fortunate that we were able to scrape together enough to do a fourth one. But if the fourth one had failed, then it would have been a game over for wow. SpaceX. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then also later that year, because of the financial meltdown, we weren't able to raise money, uh, outside money for Tesla. Uh, so uh, I, I committed all the money I had left, and then the existing investors agreed to match that, that amount. Uh, but we only closed that uh, financing round um, and got the money at 6 p.m. on Christmas Eve. Wow. Um, that was the last hour of the last day that was possible. We <laughs> so, right after Christmas. So, uh, so basically, you did fundraising? Um, well, you know, creating any company, you, 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 you've got to, to grow any company, you've got to, you've got to convince people to give you money. Um, and in order to convince people to give you money, they have to have think that there's a good chance that the money will be worth more um, after we give it to you. Uh, so, but in terms of the amount of time spent raising money, it's a pretty small percentage of what it is, less than well over 100%. Maybe 2% of your time. Thanks. Um, are you scared to go up to space? Sorry? Are you scared to go up to space? Um, I'm not going to say I'm scared to go up to space. Uh, there is certainly some risk to going to space, but um, I think uh, I think it can be uh, reduced to, to a very, very low likelihood, so I think it can be very safe. And ultimately, in order for humanity to become a space-bearing civilization and travel to other planets, it's really important to make space travel super safe. Are you going to the Mars? I'd like to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you getting animals up there first? Um, no, I think I think probably probably not. I mean, we. Uh, I think it's not because I yeah I'm not sure who would take care of them. Give me a hat. Yeah. Labrador and Puerto Rico. He has five kids too. <laughs> <laughs> you know that you're an S two Any anyone else have any questions? Bye. Hi. Um, you said that initially you were very shy and to approach people, and then you got to a point where you know where to go and who you need to talk to. How did you get from that point of being like an introvert and a shy person to? You know, meeting all these important people and pushing your idea and, you know, being at the right place at the right time. How did you make that transition? Um, I just I just forced myself to do it, even though it was, like, mentally very painful. <laughs> <laughs> so, who was the first uh, important person that you met? Like? This important person? Well, depends on how important important. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose um, probably the first like really important person I met was this guy by the name of Peter Nicholson, uh, who was uh, uh, this is when I was in Canada and uh, I was trying to get a summer job. And uh, I read this article in the newspaper uh, about this guy, and he seemed uh, he's really smart. And so I, I just uh, actually I couldn't I couldn't. I couldn't get to him directly, uh, but then I, I called the newspaper and asked to talk to the, the writer, and then I met with the writer, and then the writer connected me with Peter Nicholson. Um, he was the head of strategy for the Bank of Nova Scotia, which is one of the largest banks in Canada, and he, he later became the chief economic advisor to the Prime Minister, so he's a really smart guy. Um, and they had lunch with him, and, and uh, uh, that he, uh, and then I said, well, you know, if there's any chance of a uh, summer internship, that would be great. And, uh, and he, he actually ended up giving me a job while working for him for that, so. Wow, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. So, two more questions. Yeah. Um, I'm a 
two more questions. Any? Yes. Um, okay, so, um, how did you um, make the um, parcel? Uh, it's the business. Essentially, used the body and chassis, remove the gasoline powertrain, uh, and, and put in uh, an electric powertrain. And and then the, which there were, there were two elements to it. Uh, so there was that, uh, and then the other part was that we were licensed much technology for AC propulsion and for the powertrain. Um, now both of those premises turned out to be pretty stupid uh, because the. Uh, it, it actually ended up costing us way more to convert the uh, gas, uh, a frame that was designed for a gasoline car to electric than if we just designed something from scratch. But we still had a lot of the downsides of, uh, of the car that we used as a base platform, which was the lowest lease. And then the, um, in terms of licensing the technology for AC propulsion, it turned out that none of it was really producible. Like it was really difficult to manufacture and required a lot of work. So we have to redesign all the powertrain technology. So, uh, yeah, but uh, you know, on the other hand, if we knew we had to do everything from scratch, then maybe we were going to start the company. So, even though it was a mistake, it might have been a great mistake. So, uh, one, one more question? So one more question, and we need one more couple of pictures. So far, no, nobody's found any uh, direct signs of life. Uh, but the, um, the telescopes are, are indicating that there's a huge number of planets out there that um, are similar to Earth. So it seems likely that there's at least primitive life, like single-celled life, um, bacteria, that kind of thing. Then there's a, a much smaller number that would have sophisticated life, like plants or animals. And then a, a much, much tinier number that would have uh, like that we can talk to. Um, and that, that, that number might be zero in our region of the galaxy. Um, hopefully, well, I, hopefully it isn't. Uh, but um, we've not seen any direct communications from you know, my uh, solar system, or solar system, solar system. Yeah. 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 So, it's always like a you know, debate, like, it would be cool to discover life, but not if if that discovery is the approaching occasion, please. Do you drive the car that you design? Yeah. Nice. That's the Very quiet, it. too. Almost ran me over. I didn't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's important to always, like, you know, uh, use your product and, and figure out, um, like, what, you know, if they think, Every day about how it could be better. Mm. Uh, is there a question, Lisa? Yeah. So, how do you deal with fear? Fear of big bomb, fear of failure, fear of being ridiculed in the media. So, how do you deal with that? Um, well, I feel I feel fear quite quite strongly. I sort of like don't have fear, but uh, I think if, if I think it's important enough. Uh, you know, then, um, then I just override the view, you know, just uh, ignore it. But it's, it does cause me a lot of <coughs> stress and anger. <laughs> just Ian? So I have a question for our students. Um, how can they best reduce their carbon footprint in their everyday lives? Because I don't know if you understand, but you know regular cars, they put pollution into the air, which we breathe into our lungs, and it makes us sick. And he's invented a car that is electric, so it doesn't need gasoline. And that's like the future of our planet. And that's huge, you know? Like, so how can our students incorporate, be aware of their environment, and, and you know, increase their carbon footprint on a regular basis? Um, sure. Well, you know, I guess that your carbon footprint is pretty, it's not huge. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so. Unless you're driving like a, a big car, a big gasoline car or something, but um, 
certainly uh, vehicles are a huge source of uh, carbon. Uh, electricity is uh, still a, a significant source of, of, of carbon. Uh, that's why we need to have sustainable electricity production as well as electric cars. Um, so obviously, you know, to the degree that you can minimize your use of uh, electricity, that's, that would reduce your problem. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's probably the main thing. I, I suppose you can also be like a uh, vegetarian. Like, you know, uh, but um, yeah. She's vegan, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Are you a vegetarian? I'm, I am not a vegetarian. <laughs> I've actually, I've tried being vegetarian, I've tried being vegan, but uh, you know, I can do it. <laughs> One last question, I'm going to take a picture. And... Um, if the if electric cars are in the future, then uh, when when we be using too much electricity? Well, so it, it's important to, to produce the electricity in a way that doesn't uh, put carbon in the, in the atmosphere. Um, and that's that's where solar power is really helpful. So, so Solar City, well, we haven't talked about Solar City very much, but that's uh, that that's one of my companies that uh, uses solar panels to create electricity. So it doesn't produce any uh, carbon. Great. Thank you, Elon, for coming.